Morning, everyone. Morning, students. Morning, teachers. Morning, parents. Um, thank you so much for being patient with us. Um, as always, you know, we try to give students at least an extra 10 to 15 minutes before we begin. And it is now 10, 12. So we're going to start. And I just, again, welcome everyone, um, especially the students. We know a lot is going on and we just appreciate you coming on to the Zoom and our students and teachers on YouTube. So this presentation will be done by the wonderful and fabulous Mrs. Baxter. And uh, Mrs. Baxter, if you can yeah. just please introduce yourself, um, just so you know, to share with our audience on Zoom and YouTube, you know, who you are. Good morning, everyone. I am Zaria Baxter, Head of Department of General Studies, St. Andrew Technical High School, also the Founder and Director of the Baxter Building Scholars Outreach Program. All right. I'm an history educator, that's my area, and I really hope to learn a lot this morning from you as I anticipate that you'll take away a lot from the presentation that I have this morning, right? This morning we're going to look at metropolitan movements towards emancipation. Bearing in mind, I'm. At, but before I begin, for it go any further, are you seeing my screen? Yes, Mrs. Baxter, I can see it. Okay. If you can put it in presentation mode for us, um, by you know the icon, um, so that the PowerPoint border comes off. Right. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Just trying to get this um, border away from that area because it's seemingly blocking okay, my ability to manipulate the, the ribbon at the top. Trying to get it. A yeah, second. Do you, you can put it in um, the slideshow icon. The, and that's the thing. Oh, the ribbon not. at the top is blocking the slide, the, the, um, the Google, the Zoom ribbon at the top is blocking the, the, the ribbon for um, the slideshow. Trying to remove this at the top here. Um, yeah. Excuse me, you can, you can, you can um, press on like a space in between the words of the icon and pull it down to the bottom. Oh, thank you, Akila. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, thank now, you, thank you. We're looking, as I said before, looking at metropolitan movements towards emancipation, bearing in mind the question, the British Slave Emancipation Act, an act out of goodwill or economic sense? I want us to bear that question in mind as we go through the lesson, all right? For today, our objectives are as follows, to describe the socioeconomic context of the British West Indies by the first half of the 19th century, to critically discuss arguments posited for the passing of the Emancipation Act in the British West Indies, to discuss arguments posited by the West India lobby for slavery, to discuss the terms of the Emancipation Act, as well as to develop a sense of empathy for the enslaved of the British West Indies. Those are what we hope to achieve at the end of this lesson. Now, let us just take a look at this picture, this image. Guys, this is going to be an interactive session. I want you to interact with me, respond when you are asked questions as best as you can, but bear in mind that you mute your mic unless you are prompted to respond to a question, all right? 
Look at this image. What I mean, obviously, these persons are in a celebratory mood, right? They are, let me just contextualize, they are persons who would have been enslaved, who would have been colonial people, and they are in a celebratory mood. Can anyone tell me what type of occasion could have caused this? There is a gentleman to my left seeming to have read a decree or, or, or you know, a proclamation, and they are rejoicing. What do you think would cause something like this? Anybody? Come on, guys, I'm waiting on your responses. And trust me, responses are rewarded in this session. Go ahead, Tony. Hi, good morning. Would it be that the slaves were emancipated? Very good. I think so. The slaves would have heard that they are now free. And of course, what a joyous occasion that would be uh, for persons who are in bondage. Let's now use our imaginations a little bit more. I'm going to go through this poem and we're going to look through the mind's eye of someone who was enslaved, now free. The title of the poem is Emancipation. Shouting, cheering, the proclamation was read. Am I free? Is this true what I'm hearing? No more hard labor were thoughts running through my head. Is this now the time for me to be who I want to be? Is this now the time for us to eventually be happy? No more chains nor whips. Of course, I heard the word free. Little did I know there were different faces to the system of slavery. Now, guys, I want you to know, help me to critically assess this poem. Ms. Ba Mrs. Baxter, yes. just want to say that um, Tahiro said that the picture looks like passing of the Emancipation Act yes. and the Nico Nicholas said freedom. Good, good. And remember all our students who are on YouTube, the chat feature in YouTube can be used to participate. And we would love for you guys to participate on YouTube as well. Good, I like those responses. They are on the ball. All right. So in the first stanza, guys, do you think that the mood of the poet is the same as in the second stanza? Is there any shift in the mood? Anybody can answer me. Is the Tahira mood the same throughout? Yes. Tahira says yes. Tahira, on mute. Tahira your says mic. yes. Tell us. Expound a little bit more, Tahira. And when we, to, when we say stanza, we're talking from shouting and cheering to the line marked number four versus is this now the time to the line marked number eight? Are those stanzas the same as it relates to the mood of the poet? Anyone? No. Okay, Trudy said, yes, it changed. It changed. And then Shauna Gay says, what? Okay, so, all right, so Tiara or Tiara or Trudy, just you unmute your mic and just tell us a little more now. Why are you saying yes? That's what Mrs. Baxter tried to pull out her uno. Why did you say it changed? Because history is a subject where you have to express yourselves in order to get your marks. They went from a state of being happy and in disbelief to a state of being um, uncertain and it seemed to me a little disappointed at stanza eight. Little did I know they were different phases to the system of slavery. Very good. The disappointment is there. So it, it, it is indicative that the poet is now reflecting in hindsight 
right? That, yeah, that I, person would have been given the opportunity to go through the process of apprenticeship and gone into the post-slavery society and is now looking back with Mrs. disappointment. Yes? Tiaros or Tiaros, sorry if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, um, says, um, I'm just trying to read some of the comments. Yes. Um, hold on, let's, sorry guys, this thing is acting up. Says they were happy. And then Tony says, a shift from happiness to curiosity. And Nick Callow says, it was a change from excitement to unsure or curiosity to what next. Tiara says, then they were uncertain. Yes. So we're seeing a lot of emotions coming out. Uncertainty, excitement, disappointment. So it's really a progression, right? And this would maybe be indicative of really what the, 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 the newly emancipated enslaved persons, the newly emancipated, emancipated ex-slaves, ex-slave persons felt going into emancipation and what happened after emancipation going into the post-slavery society. So we will use this poem and its analysis as a springboard to launch further into understanding aspects surrounding the Emancipation Act and the role that the Metropole played in this whole process. Can anybody tell me what a Metropole is? Go ahead and type it in the chat. Use up your search engines if you have to. What's a Metropole? Because we're looking at metropolitan movements towards emancipation. Um, it is basically referring to the 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 country that the, the colonizers basically right so the so parent country or the mother country good so we, we know that we have that in context we are going to look at Britain for the purpose of this lesson as the mother country of colonies in the West Indies and of course we know that the West Indies had territories that are different parent countries or metropoles, but we are making specific reference for this lesson on the British West Indies, right? And here we have some of the countries and the year that they were acquired, right? And here is a map featuring the geographical space that we are focusing on as it relates to the British West Indies. And as I said before, this area would feature different metropoles. Of course, we are looking at the British West Indies. Now, let's zoom into the British abolitionists leading up to 1807. And 1807 is a, a watershed year, if you will, for a significant reason. What happened in 1807, guys? The slave trade was abolished. The British Good. So we are looking at just to mention a few of the abolitionists, persons who advocated for that process to take place. Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, Granville Sharp, agitating for the end of the slave trade. And of course, their efforts were not left unabated. They, they, they came under heavy attack from an interest group called the West, India, the West India Interest. And it was really a lobby group in Britain that represented the interest of persons who wanted to maintain the sugar industry and the slavery in the British West Indies. And of course, they sought to counter the actions posited by the abolitionists. All right? So we, these are two significant players that will be coming up throughout the lesson. All right. So, of course, there were arguments because all of this played out in court, in parliament, that is, on a political stage. Now, 
who do you think, which of the interest groups that I mentioned previously do you think would be arguing against the slavery? Which of the interest groups would be arguing? I mentioned the two interest groups, the abolitionists and the West India interest. Which of the two would be arguing against the slavery guys? The abolitionists. Okay, good. Now, their arguments were pivoted based on humanitarian grounds, economic grounds, and religious grounds. So when we speak of humanitarian grounds, we're speaking of the welfare of human beings. That's the position that they're taking and that's where their arguments are coming from. When we are speaking about economic reasons, we are talking about um, cost and benefit. Is this profitable? Does this make sense economically? And when we speak of religious grounds, we're talking about the values that you hold based on your religious beliefs. What do you think is important? And really, what ideals should be, you be putting forward and actions based on your religious inclination? So we're going to go a little bit more detailed as it relates to these arguments from the abolitionist perspective. So for the humanitarian argument, they were saying that slavery was really inhumane. You're denying these persons of legal rights. They can't testify in court. They are dehumanized. They cannot have a family. Their family can be sold, you know, it's just inhumane from an economic standpoint. They were arguing that, I mean, it is way more expensive to have forced labor than free labor. It is so expensive to put systems in place to maintain slavery as a system, right? The mortality rate of the slaves are so high, they're dying from a plethora of diseases, right? So if you are spending money to buy these persons and import them in the colonies to feed the labor market for the sugar industry, I mean, it's wasted investment when they, they, they die in droves, right? And they were arguing also that the British government stood to gain more if there was the free market system doing away with mercantilism and this closed market system and preferential treatment for colonies, you know, open up the markets, allow these persons to become the, 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 the buyers of manufactured goods, they allow them to earn, you know, that's where their argument was coming from. And from the religious perspective, they were saying, we are a Christian country, right? And I mean, this type of treatment to others is really against our religious beliefs. It, does, it, it, it goes against the very grain of, who we should be, of what we should be standing for and who we should be. So these are the arguments that the abolitionists put forward. Now let's see what arguments the West India interests would have put forward because of course, they would have sought to counter in the many debates that they were having in parliament on the matter. So humanitarian arguments, re the arguments for slavery posited by the West Indian interest would state that slavery in the Caribbean was way more better than the barbaric and destitute conditions that these guys were experiencing in Africa, right? So they were not living the ideal life as a gentleman anyway. That's what they're saying. On economic grounds, they were, they were saying that the blacks were ideal for plantation labor. They were accustomed to the climate. They could adjust to working in the hot sun and it was more economically viable to use slave labor than free labor. And moreover, they were saying that the sugar industry the benefits derived from it stimulated the growth of the Industrial Revolution, right? They were also saying that on a religious ground that, I mean, the Bible said that you should um, obey your masters. Of course, there was elements of servitude in the Bible, 
and these persons were now being exposed to Christianity. They, their souls could be redeemed. What are you talking about? So they are in good hands. So this, these are the arguments put forward by the West India interest, right? And we are gonna touch a little bit more as we go into the lesson as it relates to what was happening in Britain at this time and all the other factors that came to being why there was such a heavy debate. All right. Now, in 1807, of course, abolition of the slave trade. I mean, if you can't get any more slaves legally to come into the colonies, the argument was that, of course, these slave owners would now be taking care of these um, enslaved persons because they, they were not going to get them in ready supply. So they would have to tend to how they treat them and, and treat them well so that they, their lifespan is longer, so that they are more inclined to work for them and not revolt. But of course, Things didn't unfold quite that way. Mrs. And, Baxter? Yes? Um, I just want to say that Shelly's on YouTube, one of our students, yes. says that, and they use Christianity to convert them. Yes. Yeah, they use Christianity. It's very good. They use it to convert them. But we can see, and we are going to see, that the Christian teachings really did not made them docile and receptive to servitude because of course, even the very Baptist war was led by a bishop himself, right? So the British campaign after 1807, they had persons had to, 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 to reform and, and, and come again to say, listen, we are going to put an end to this. We are still seeing that the treatment is bad and everything is, you know, so there is no move for reform and to try to preserve and, and, and put forward better treatment for the enslaved. So there were, there was a mass campaign and we're talking about having a, a report, a newspaper that is focused on anti-slavery information. And, and, and dissemination of, 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 of um, you know, findings regarding what is happening in the West Indies. Legislative acts, of course, lobbying, trying to get um, influence parliamentary decisions as it relates to the business of slavery. public lectures and petitions, these are some of the strategies that the humanitarians used to capture the attention of persons in Britain who could effect change as it relates to the sugar industry and also sensitize the general public as to what is happening in the, in the islands. You know, at what cost, real cost that they were drinking sugar in their, um, tea and enjoying the benefits of the industry. So let's look at the economic context. Now, during the course when the Emancipation Act was passed, I mean, Cuba provided serious competition for the British West India and sugar producers, right? So Cuba still had the advantage of slave labor. They had virgin soil. They started their sugar production later. So the soil was ripe and ready. The yield was good coming from the soil quantity and quality. They had available land and reliable labor force. All right? Within that same time period that the Emancipation Act came about, there was really an overproduction of sugar on the world market. And of course, when you have a glut, there is a spiraling down of price for anything, right? And that was the same for sugar. 
Now, we spoke to the whole idea of industrialization before. Can anybody tell me what industrialization really is in their own words? Even if you use your search engines, explain what you understand from what you researched. What was industrialization? Um, well, industrialization was basically the use of technology, more modern types of technology in the production of sugarcane. Okay. And Tiara says introducing machinery to make work easier. Tiara, your mic now work? What? <laughs> you have your beautiful voice. Or you we are appreciating of it. any means of communication. No, All right, that's good. Thank you for my responders. Good. No, in a broader sense, yes, it's use of machinery. It's moving away from manual labor. It's moving away from cotton industry, the cottage, sorry, cottage industry, to moving into use of factories to take control of production. And when you have machines doing the work of what man would do manually, it means that you're really and truly moving away from the need to have this large labor force that is centered around um, persons using their hands to conduct production. Right? Mrs. Baxter, Tony yes. she says, transition from basic tools to machinery on farms. Well, yes. agricultural, generally speaking. Generally speaking, because of course, the cotton gin was very instrumental in the industrial revolution in Britain in the 18th century, because of course, it started with the textile industry and moved further to mechanizing the agricultural sector. So further in the different units, you would have seen the centrifugal and the vacuum pans, the centrifuges and all of those things that would have made work on the sugar um, plantations way more productive, way more efficient and less time consuming and with the use of less manual labor, right? So the quantity and quality of British West Indies sugar had declined, you know, it was declining, right? And they were, they were forced to sell it even more cheaply. So the business wasn't going good, right? And I want to be a man that this was a business, right? During the same period that the act was passed, you, you are looking at violent resistance, the Demerara revolt and the Christmas rebellion, further strengthening the arguments of those abolitionists who were fighting for emancipation, right? No. I would want, I, I have a prize for someone who can just tell me the year in which these different activities came about and how these activities influenced the sugar industry in the British West Indies. The amelioration proposal, Society for the Mitigation and Gradual Abolition of Slavery, Abolition of the Slave Trade. Come on, guys. I have your prize right here with me and I'll share it once I get my winner. Miss McDavid, please note the first um, person who types the, year, the years correctly I'm, I'm, in the I'm chat waiting. correctly. And then we will invite that person to speak on how these different events impacted the sugar industry. Trudy, are you going to answer? I see your mic is off. You ready? I see Kiandre says 1798. For what? That's all the time. No, no, that's not. I'm sorry, that's not correct. Oh no! Come on, guys. The prize we, is. I would just. I would. The, the the last one is a giveaway. You know, we discussed that already. 
Uh, me. <laughs> Ciara says 1823. Trudy, um, what do you say? The I mean, the creation proposal was in 1823. Mm -hmm. The abolition of the slave in um, 1807. Yes. Uh, uh, I think the Society for Mitigating the that one was in eighteen was the seventeen or I I the, the, the last part of that tapered off. I didn't hear clearly. What was the Society for the Mitigation and Gradual Abolition was in what year? Hello? 1787. No. Double check that one. Come on, Tiara. You got one right. Tiara said 18. You got two. What, Tiara said 1823 from amelioration. Right. Okay, abolition of slave trade, 1807. Yeah. Come on, Tiara. Close, man. You're close. As a matter of fact, two of those years are the same. Come on, guys. Yes. Hey, um, Shauna Gay says, yes. amelioration in oh, What so, the You're kind of breaking up. All right. So let me go again. So the proposal was in 1823. And right. gradual abolition of slavery was also in 23 and the abolition of the slave trade was 1807 good we have a winner and we have it from the um the in the the dairy industries of jamaica we have a winner i'm excited when you guys win stuff you will be getting a workbook exploring history workbook two courtesy of back to building products. Now, the dairy industries has given you a, 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 a goodie bag as well with some wonderful items. And I hope you enjoy. I will leave your prize with Miss Matt David for you to pick up and you will hear more about the workbook and how it can benefit you in your Congrats, journey. Trudy. So Trudy, congratulations. Uh, congrats, Trudy. Um, boy, Mrs. Baxter, it was well close. Thank man. you. <laughs> the, I mean, the students were on it. Shelly's, yes, they nearly get it. Tiara, you were so close. Boy, man, I think they were. The but there are, were there are other prizes. So yeah, man, the fingers were burning. Let, let, let's see what goes on yeah, in the rest of the lesson. Stretch they, the fingers, guys. Get those fingers ready or those ready. unmute buttons. All right, so we are looking at the historical context of the British slave emancipation and what happened after 1807. Because as we said before, things did not go as planned. The enslaved were still being ill-treated. They were still dying in mass numbers. So we are looking at different players carrying on the journey to no end slavery as a system in, in, in totality. So we're looking at a Thomas Foxwell Buxton, a Zachary Macaulay, Dr. Lushington, Lord Suffield. These are some of the names that will come up. And let us now look at the terms of the British Slave Emancipation Act, of course, when it finally was passed, because of course, uh, the debate was not won by the West India interest. The, of course, we, we, we mentioned um, resistance, violent resistance and all of that coming out of the period to further strengthen the arguments posited by the abolitionists. So the, the, the Slave Emancipation Act of 1834 stated that slaves of six years and older were to serve a period of apprenticeship. 
right? For domestic slaves, four years, and field slaves, six years. So children under six years old, you are free. Apprentices were to work 40 and a half hours for free and hours thereafter to be paid by their masters. Or in this case, their, their, um, their boss, it would be in a similar term. They were not really quite free, but really not enslaved. So it's just that inter intermediate period, right? 20 million pounds were provided to compensate the planters for their loss of labor. Planters were to continue to provide food, clothing, shelter, and medical care for their apprentices, right? If you didn't choose to give your apprentices food, you should make, as a, as a planter, you should make um, available provision grounds so that they could grow their supplies. Apprentices, could purchase their freedom. Now, let us look critically at the terms of the Emancipation Act. Do you think that this is something, guys, that is feasible, that would have worked out and they were to peaceably transition into freedom between 34 and 1840, as the apprenticeship um, period would stipulate? Do you think that this was a smooth sailing down into freedom, full freedom? Question being asked, anybody? Do you think that there were hiccups along the way? Between the period, 1834, going down? That Shelley would have been the apprenticeship? Shelly says, not really, miss, because the planters didn't really agree with it. And Kiandra says no. No, the, so, the, so they were living peaceably? Because what you are answering to is that they were living peaceably. Did they have problems during the apprenticeship period? And I'm talking the planters and the apprentices. What was Shana their problem? Gray says, no, this was just a way to extend slavery and no task holder were happy. Trudy says there were issues. There were that issues. says they did face challenges. Good. Can 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 just can they just unmute a one at a time with your indication, Miss Miss Matt David, and just allow them to just give me one example of an issue that 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 came to being during the apprenticeship period. Okay, sure. Any student? Let me see. Shalice, you want to respond? Or Zalika, you can unmute your mic if you'd like. Or Shauna um, Gay. <clears throat> Tony, go ahead. Um, so one of the, the, the challenges that they faced were, well, the British government faced mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. as they found it difficult um, to transition the master and slave relationship into an employer and employee relationship because Very the cool. planters were used to owning the slaves. And another problem faced was that the planters counted the number of hours from the time the apprentices arrived at work while the apprentices wanted the hours to be counted from the time that they left home. Good, excellent. Anybody else? What just so th yes. those are some of the issues regarding Me. relationships. Yeah. Anybody else? Me, miss. The apprentices were sometimes threatened with demotation to the field. Good. Rudy, okay. you want to say something? Can yes. Uh, Rudy first and the then Akila. Uh, the Emancipation Act was passed it as one of the first and said before it spoke about the hours of labor on the plantation but the hunters did not equally especially in like jamaica they did not disseminate the hours properly so yes. they would break up the hours so that it could go for example into the weekend and the saturdays were worth be 
the days that say you've got to go to the market, but they extended like the work hours into the, the which would have taken away time that the slaves had got to get to, go to the market. And in, in addition, it was an attempt to really prolong the, the labor force, the free labor force Good. on plantation. Good. Um, yeah. And yes. They, yeah, they, yes. They sent. So, all right. So Thank let you. me give some nice. Oh, good stuff, Trudy. So, uh, sorry, Trudy. Sure. Um, Akila, would you like to go next? Yes, Miss. Miss, I was saying that they found it difficult to find suitable candidates to serve as stipendary magisters because the, the men that ended up being the stipendary magisters were retired soldiers. So they were old and in turn, they got beaten up by the people that were working as um, in the apprenticeship, which would be the ex-slaves. They, so, they were beaten up like that? Okay. It's like, because you see, because they were old and sometimes because no, that is um, apprenticeship, they don't really want to follow the rules anymore because they don't side with what the planters want to say. So in turn, when like the stipendary magisters would say something, they would sometimes gang up on the stipendary magisters and beat them because of their age. Okay, but maybe that's okay. a one-off thing. To <laughs> add what you said about, Hello, to add what you said about the stipendary magistrates, they were overworked. Yeah, and there were a lot of yeah. them, and they 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 have enough resources. In some cases, um, their pay was not sufficient because yeah. they had to um. They had to supply their own old soul and their RCs and they had to travel far distance to the farms mm -hmm. and neither the apprentices or the planters were really welcoming of them. They were exposed to sicknesses and they were um, exposed to diseases and the heat and the elements and in <laughs> some cases they choose to be biased because they were friends of the planters mm -hmm. so and mm -hmm. even if they weren't initially planned as a friend of the planters in order to have some sort of a comfortable life in the West Indies, they would have to, you know, somewhat side with the planters. And so the apprentices were not supported. They yes. did not have anybody defending them and so on. Uh, Mrs. Baxter, we have yes. um, Tayana Moore on YouTube said, yes, Miss, yes. they had a problem. They had problems with their pay because of the way the planters counted the hours. Yes. So thank you, Kiana, on YouTube. Um, we good. have quite a bit of um, this question really got the students fired yes. up. I tell you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but we mean, have it, that's Tiara. good. Yeah, man. Tiara says, yes, they were planters because the apprenticeship did not see the terms as beneficial. Yeah. Um, Trudy says, um, uh, yeah, attempt to prolong labor. Um, yeah, Tiara again. Tiara can't participate via mic, so she's typing in her responses. Okay. Um, so apprentice, apprentices were not happy working 40 and a half hours free. Yes. Um, let's see. Shelly says planters classified artisans as praedal. Praedal, I'm not sure. If that's yes, praedal. Mm -hmm. Praedal, okay. Um, in order to maintain the labor for six years. Um, Shana Gay said the planters would charge the slaves for rent. Shelley says apprentices were dissatisfied with the act. They couldn't understand why free people should work without any pay. And then yes. Zalika said the planters tried to keep apprentices attached to their state for as long as possible. Um, yeah, man. Wow. Okay. Very good. I mean, my students are on a roll, man. Yeah, oh, Lord, yes, yes. man. Trudy says, it. both ex-slaves and planters felt the stipendary magistrates were in support of either group. So they, yes. were, in, so they were distrustful among both groups. Freed slaves, sorry, field slaves had to give more years than the other groups of slaves. All oh. right. Okay. Wow. So we're looking at a situation where they... There, there was a conundrum of problems, a plethora of problems, because of course, 
they step in their magistrate's record between a rock and a hard place, not being able to, to satisfy the expectations of either party, right? So there, were, there was also a lot of problems stemming from the point of view of the metropole, right? The metropole not being able to flesh out clearly what the parameters are, how the, the transaction between the apprentices and the planters would work out a lot of issues were, were there, unresolved issues, issues that were difficult. And, and, and um, they, of course, the and their magistrates having minimal resources to work with during this period of confusion and the gnashing of teeth. All right, gnashing of teeth, I tell you. So the apprenticeship system as persons pointed out was introduced in the British West Indies for two main reasons, to supply planters with a steady labor force in the interim period and to enable both the planters and formerly enslaved, now laborers to transition into a working relationship, all right? And not one of servitude and enslavement. So of course, persons would have hit the nail on the head as it relates to why the apprenticeship system failed and subsequently, you know, the apprenticeship period ending prematurely in 38 instead of 40, right? So there was unfair treatment to the formerly enslaved. I mean, the, the very little garden plots that you used to have prior to emancipation. I mean, you're telling that they must pay your rent for its use now. The magistrates were few and ineffective. We exhausted that, right? And of course, persons who were enslaved used every opportunity, bought their freedom, just left the whole setting altogether. So you know, that is another nail in the coffin of the sugar industry in itself as a business. So let's think now, based on your understanding of the Emancipation Act, which of the three interest groups below stood to truly benefit from the end of slavery? The planters, the metropole, or the enslaved? I have a lovely prize for the winner. Ms. McDavid, let us keep our eyes out now for the first responder. Ready, Mrs. Preston. Ready, guys. Ready. The planters. Kendra, why? Yeah, remember, guys, saying? you have to justify your response. Um, Trudy, Keandra, Akila, you guys answered first with the planter, but you need to justify. Which any of you want to go first? Okay, the planters because it it extended the number of years that they would have gotten for free labor. Um, it also, they were also going to be compensated even though they were getting um, this free labor. Um, two reasons. Akila, okay. would you like to try? Anybody Keandra? else? Miss, they will get secure of um, the labor. I didn't check the security label. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Akilo? Akilo, you want to try? All right. No. I am I I do have a winner. I want because of course the planters would have been compensated. The money that they got 
is millions compared, you know, in those times it's a lot of money and in this time it's still a lot of money. They got good cash to say, okay, we're, 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 we're depriving you of your, 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 your labor force, your investment in this industry and we're going to compensate you. And on top of that, we are still allowing you to have this labor at your disposal for a couple more years. So the enslaved were not happy, right? And the planters were still not satisfied. So Miss Matt David, please just ask the first responder to just privately text you their um, number, tell their, their, their preference as it relates to um, service provider, because I have a phone card for them. Is it a Digicel or a Lime provider that they have? I would like the number to be sent to. All right. So the, so the no first problem, responder so can thank you. text Miss Matt David. All right. We're moving on and give her your credentials as it relates to your service provider and um, the number that you'd like the credit to be added to. Now, guys, look at this image that you're looking at um, carefully. You're seeing it on your screen. Look at it carefully. Tell me what you see. The first thing that you see and what you see uh -huh. after, if any. I see a horse. Olivia says she sees a frog. Okay. Anybody um, else sees anything different? I can see a horse. Amik, I can't, I'm not sure if I'm butchering your name, says a horse, then a frog. Lasanes, Lasanes, says a horse in water. Oh. Oh, good. So I, I, I too can relate to these varied responses, but first I saw a horse, then I saw a frog leaning forward. Right, like um, being perched somewhat on a stone, right? No, I want to tell me the ambiguity displayed in the previous image. Does it relate in any way as to why there was an intense campaign to end slavery? What say you? Let me hear the response to know what's happening here in terms of prices. Hmm? And we know what is ambiguity, right? Somebody tell us, please. Ambiguity is basically something that can be understood in more than one way. Very good. So we saw where, we, where, where, where this image played with our imagination, it played with our eyes. We saw more than one pictures of the same picture. Can, do you think there's, there was any ambiguity as it relates to really why there was this intense campaign to end slavery? Can I interject? Yes, Shana. So the ambiguity, yes, it does. On the surface, um, and for the persons in England, slavery looked like this system that was providing. Um, one was, on the Christian point of view, was converting the Christians, um, the, the pagan Africans to Christianity. And next, it's, it looked like something that was helping to make the economy within England boom. And however, they didn't see the underbelly. A lot of persons in England didn't see the underbelly of slavery. I know slaves wasn't even welcome into the Christian faith and they were discriminated and they didn't understand the, the dehumanizing impacts of slavery until the campaign was launched and they started showing photos and posters and reading articles and educating the people. And then they realized that this thing is not just servitude. It is dehumanizing. De de and that is somewhat what ambiguity came in. Not only that, the reliance on slavery um, crippled their economy in many ways and was 
preventing them from growing and expanding into different trades and different items. And so they, they were trying to show moving away from slavery can open so much more opportunity than staying with slavery would do. Wow, what a response. Very insightful. And you know, <laughs> ironically, in the last part, you were zooming right around the point that I wanted to hit the nail on the head with. I wanted, and you were almost there. Anybody can further develop. That last point that was made by Shana can be further developed, expounded on, to zoom into where I want to go, where the ambiguity lies. Um, Eva, I think what you're, uh, based on what I said, is that the, the ambiguity is that slavery seems to be an economically good choice, but in fact, it wasn't. It was not, they, they, they were so, it, it, and that is why some of, that's why the industrialists fight against it. And because with slavery, you have a smaller market force than you could have wanted. With slavery, there was limitations in the things that they were, they, they were able to produce and the places that they were able to trade because there were so many barriers with trading when slavery was in. And with the ending of slavery, these things were open. Good. Yes, you're, you are right there. And Ms. McDavid, this responder, Shana, also be getting a phone card. So please um, send uh, Ms. McDavid a private message with your particulars. Thank you. Congrats, no, congrats, guys. There were underlying reasons for the pressure to pass the Emancipation Act. The growth of industrialization depended largely on the end of a manual labor force, you know. We, you, we're coming in with machines now. We need a market for our, our, our manufactured goods. We have factories. Where are we going to get persons from to buy these manufactured goods? The slaves will be, the ex-slaves, I'm sorry, will be good, um, good customers. We don't need to have them under forced labor anymore. No, Adam Smith, who is an economist, a philosopher, wrote the book Wealth of Nations in the 18th century. And the, 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 um, the rationale that he was giving was saying that it was really positing that forced labor is not good labor. It's more expensive. Free these people. Allow them to earn and they will be more inclined to work because they will be motivated to pay. That will make them more product productive. Right? Nations who that want to grow and be wealthy. Look here, forget this mercantilist idea, this closed market system. Open up the market, free market. Don't protect any market because it's a colony. And you will, your economy will grow. And of course, he was really, that's what the industrialists were, 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 were really feeding on and listening to. And it made perfect sense to them. If we opened up and we utilized the benefits of industrialization, that could, go, as a matter of fact, the sugar industry, industry is not even doing so well right now. It is on the decline. Right? We're using steam power. We don't need manual labor, right? So these are some of the different underlying reasons, hence the ambiguity. We need to free these people and free them now. And of course, the enslaved had their own ideas and ambitions. We need to free ourselves from below the best way we know how, if it's even through violent means. Right, so we are down to our little quiz time. 
Anybody can recall which territory in the Caribbean produced sugar that provided the biggest competition for the British West Indies sugar production? And why was that territory successful? Trudy says Cuba. Very good. Very good. Shelley says Cuba. Who was the first? Because we can only give um the 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 um the prize to the first responder. But the uh, the second answer was correct as well. All right. So Trudy was the first one. Trudy responded first to question one. Yes, Trudy responded first. But why, Mrs. Baxter? Missing Trudy finger them too good enough <laughs> because Trudy well, already win. If <laughs> Trudy win credit, I need. I think we need to give it to somebody. Somebody, somebody else. else. Okay. No disrespect, Trudy, but we need to share the wealth. All right. So, so let's go around for the second question then and see yeah. what's happening. We're not shutting down Trudy now. All right. Describe three strategies used by the British abolitionists. Oh, Trudy more. actually saying that she's willing to give it up to Tiara who came second. Okay, no problem. Describe three strategies used by the British abolitionists to promote the campaign against slavery. Quickly, this should be rolling off your fingertips. Tiffany says, wait, is this a bit weird? Tiara says petition. Tiffany says pamphlet, petition, and arguments. And arguments? Yeah, pamphlet, petition, and arguments. But Tiara said petition. Not sure. All right. Maybe. You uh, guys, I think. She, I think try again. I think um, the second, the, um, the, the, the argument, we can give it to her. Um, I think she wants to say lectures. All right. Tiara and says posters and speeches by the missionaries. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I am more inclined to go with the, the lecture, the person who said pamphlets, petitions, and arguments slash lectures and stuff. All right. Okay, Which no two problem. major acts of violent resistance played a significant role as it relates to when the British government passed the Emancipation Act. Come on, guys. This shouldn't take us long. Anybody miss Matt David? I'm not, I'm not seeing anybody answer yet. Surprising. And we discussed it earlier in the lesson. We highlighted those two major violent resistance. Right? Then Maria Revolt and Christian and Christmas Rebellion. Very good. I see, Who said okay. that? Tiara said Okay, okay, now I see people. Zalika said Sam Sharp Rebellion. Tiara said Demarara Christian Rebellion. Christmas, it's not Christian. So, no, I just heard somebody say it, you know. Kiandra? Kiandra, Kiandra, get the answer. Oh, the, the okay. Sam Sharp slash Christmas Rebellion and the Demarara yes. revolt. Very good. So, Kiandra is the winner there. And please give Miss Matt David your information because it's um, a phone card. Now, the takeaways. The British Slave Emancipation Act came to being as a result of a combination of factors, right? So industrialization, you know, the wanting to reap the benefits and this outmoded means of production and, uh, you know, slave labor was really hampering the expansion of the markets and, and, and really hampering the, the way forward as it relates to Britain seizing the opportunities to be derived from the Industrial Revolution. 
slave rebellions and the decline in the profitability of the British West Indies sugar industry. And we looked at that decline, we saw the competitors, right? We saw the competitor, Cuba providing um, the main competition and biggest competition in the Caribbean here, right? So we saw that sugar was on the decline in terms of profitability and Britain was looking elsewhere to boost their economy. Now, I'm going to introduce you to my workbooks, Exploring History Workbook 1 and Exploring History Workbook 2. Now, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more on how these workbooks can be utilized to help you to hone the skills needed to get excellent marks for CSEC history. And they're at an economic cost. I think somebody won um, a workbook as well, 2,500 per copy, right? And my phone number is there. Excellent for students, excellent for educators, right? But we're talking about honing 21st century learning skills, right? This is where it's at. For history, for exploring history workbook one, you'll be seeing activities centered around what is history, the nature of history, and how historians go about gathering information and interpreting information, right? Amerindians, the Tainos and the Kalinagos activities are there for understanding those societies. The encomienda system, indentureship, transatlantic slave trade, and movements towards emancipation. And as I said, th this is a workbook and it's helping you to hone the research skills, the critical thinking skills, the five E's, the four C's, right? The follow-up workbook, Exploring History Workbook 2, is centered on the emergence of ancient civilizations, right? So we look at the Aztecs, the Mayas, the Incas, and, you know, looking at how these civilizations grew into, um, you know, civilized societies in that period. Feudalism in Europe, 14th to 15th century, the Renaissance, and you know that really gives a, a wealth of information as to the, the ethos from which the explorers to the new world arrived, right? What was happening in Europe during the Middle Ages that encouraged exploration? region settled by the Europeans in the New World. So the different areas help the, the, the educator, that's a teacher, as well as a student to move along with the CSEC curriculum, right? And building the skills and knowledge base as the students as they go along, all right? Now, here's our question and answer segment. If there are any questions, Feel free to ask. I know that we, we interacted so much throughout the course of the lesson, Miss McDavid. We had a whale of a time. And Definitely. some very, very good responses from our students. You can see that we are reading and thinking, and I'm proud of you and happy for that. Are we seeing any questions in the chat, Ms. McDavid? No, not yet. Okay. We have basically come to the end of our session. You know, and I, I, I must say that I am really happy to have been here and to have shared with you. I enjoyed this lesson immensely. I learned so much. From you guys and do look forward to sharing with you again over to you miss matt david well mrs backstop um in case no one has any questions right now or comments 
I want you to find or can think of for me a well hard question. <laughs> like, I won't give out a prize now, guys. So, like, what's like yo, the hardest of hardest? <laughs> because I have. We can't, we can't ask them key questions. <laughs> Like they need to Google, they need to think because, well, I only, I have some credit from the Digicel Foundation that I'd like to give away. Um, and it's $3,000 worth of Digicel credits. Wow. So come on guys, if you wow. wanna win Mrs. Baxter. All right. Make it well earned. And you guys, <laughs> unmute your mic if you can to respond. So get ready, get the Google ready. All right. Now guys, what was the, 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 Jonathan, the Jonathan Strong case about, the Jonathan Strong case about, and who, was at the center of that case as an abolitionist. Why was that case important? Uh, Mrs. Baxter, they're asking if you can repeat the question. All right, the Jonathan Strong case. What, in a nutshell, what was it about? Why was it important? And which abolitionist really was at the center of that case? Miss, um, can I go? Okay, no go problem. Go right ahead, Tony Shea. Go right ahead. All right. So um, the Jonathan Strong case was about a slave who was badly beaten and that slave was Jonathan Strong and the person, the, the um, what would I call that person now? One of the humanitarians. Name of the humanitarian, name, name, that name. That person was Granville Sharp. Nice. And so he assisted Jonathan Strong with the help of his brother who was a doctor. And so they admitted him to a hospital where he was treated. And then after he was treated, they helped him to get a job, which was at a pharmacy. And then two years after that, um, Jonathan Strong Master, who was a lawyer living in London, he was originally from Barbados, he reclaimed Strong. And so he, after he reclaimed him, he sold him and he was boarded on a ship for Jamaica. And because of that, Granville Sharp took Strong's case to court and secured his release. And um, as a result of that, Sharp became intent on getting a definite ruling on the status of slaves in England. And after that- <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said you're reading something. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, that's very good. No, but guess what, guys? It she deserved the price. She deserves no, she it. She does. Because exactly. remember what Mrs. Baxter said. And I said, get your Google ready. Yes, and if you're reading, you're reading fluently. No, she, exactly. So, Tony <laughs> Shea, I applaud no, your girl. Most of it I said out of my head. The only part that I read was the result part. Okay. Because Tony Shea, very good, Tony. Win your win. <laughs> Good job, love. Good yes, job. So just send me your thing and you'll get the lovely reel of $3,000 worth of credit from the Digicel Foundation. Direct message me now, okay? All right. All now, right. Um, oh, Mrs. Baxter, we have a yes. question for you saying, do you do evening classes? Yes. I. In terms of evening class, for this summer, I'm really doing um, extra classes. Um, so persons can contact me on that. Um, I have a summer camp program, an intervention program for this summer. All right? 
And as I said, it's intervention, so it's not expensive because it's really about trying to build capacity, uh, you know, in terms of competencies where the students are experiencing gaps. All right. Okay, guys, we have any other questions from Mrs. Baxter before we go today? Mrs. Baxter, I didn't hear clearly what you said about intervention. Summer, could you repeat? Okay, the summer camp, Baxter Building Scholars Summer Camp, um, the, the foundation that I had introduced before, right? We're having an intervention program designed on a help, designed to help students to build their competencies in several skill areas. We're talking about math, English, history, social studies, bio, you know, and we are introducing students to sign language, you know, and, you know, coping skills. So, you know, these are just some of the things that we are going to introduce our students to and get them up and ready for the next the school year. So the cost for the entire month of July from 5th to 29th is only $5,000 because of, of course, it's an intervention program, as I said, and really geared at assisting students. It's an online program? Yes. Yes, very small class size. We're not having a lot of students. So it's a first come, first serve thing. You register via um, a Google link that is sent to you. You pay the 5,000 contribution fee online as well. All right. Any other questions for Mrs. Baxter? Do you want me to go ahead with the next question? Sure. Go right. right ahead, Mrs. Baxter. No. I want someone to tell me the, what were the terms, what were some of the terms of the amelioration proposal, right? What was the rationale behind the amelioration proposal? And how significant was this proposal in the ending of slavery? So the rationale behind it, some of the terms, and how significant it was to the move to end the slavery. Reason, the reason, right? Yes, the rationale. Yes, Tayira, the rationale. Tahira says, was to make living conditions better for the enslaved. Yes, so she has to continue with the terms and what was it, the significance of this proposal to the ending of slavery. Tiara, you wanted, okay, I see Kiandra says, terms was slave marriage. Slaves were to have Saturday for market and Sunday for church. Trudy says to make slaves living conditions better. Tony Shea says, outlawed the flogging of women, benefited women. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're on the ball, you know, so miss. Matt David, you're going to have to go share the credit, you know, because you're yeah, right. But no Hold one on. person is answering everything. No one person is answering. Shelly says the record should be kept of the flogging. Brianna says overseers could not carry whips in the field. Yes, that's correct. Sarah says slaves were not to be punished on the same day. They did the offense. Tony Shea says slave marriages were to be encouraged. Kiandra says slaves could not be sold. 
Okay. Meaning family is not separated. Okay. Shelley says slaves were now able to be a part of Christianity. They were always encouraged to be a part of Christianity. Okay. All right. So I, I really want one person taking on this. Shelly, you Please. want to answer? you Please. want to say your answer more? Go yes, ahead. Miss, about the Christian department, they yeah. weren't really allowed to go in church and, you know, sit beside a certain white people, Miss, so they could now legally be a part of the Christian group and do more in that religion, Miss. What I, what I do know, though, I'm not sure where, where your source lies, but what I do know is that in terms, not everybody um, could be really allowed to preach, you know? But in terms of, I mean, sitting beside a white person, I, I, I don't think the amelioration proposal would allow that. There was still some, a lot of segregation and stuff that, that, that these things were entrenched in the society you know it was still a safe society no miss i wasn't saying that they were able to sit beside oh. him just saying that they were you know legally and the thing about the anglican church miss, i think they weren't really allowed there so they could go now under the amelioration slaves so normally yeah belong to the baptist for the most part, as if it, when, and when you look through the unit, you'll see, for the most part, yes, they, they, it's really for the, 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 the underprivileged then, eh? in terms of the slave population, that's where Samuel Sharp was from, and um, Vogel. All right. Guys, we wanted one person to just take the question and, 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 and tear it apart. And, and, and we didn't get that. We got, we got fragments of answers. Um, I see, well, no, let me see Mrs. Baxter. We have, uh, let's, um, is it Tiffany Thomas? Tiffany, can you unmute your mic and tell Mrs. Okay. Baxter your, your full response? Tiffany? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Tiffany. Read, tell Mrs. You typed it in, but Mrs. Baxter would like to hear your response. Miss, I said that um, the reason was to ameliorate the conditions of the slave terms. And I said that this, uh, the terms was that the slave registration was mandatory, punishments were limited, branding was prohibited, um, education was compulsory, and the significance of the act was that the act served as an economic function and is based in the abolition of the slave trade. All right, not a hundred. I, I wanted something more profound. The act, the the um the um the um the, um, the the 1823 proposal, it was significant as it relates to an activity that further strengthened the move to emancipate the slaves. I want to hear that coming from it. What was that event? And where did it occur? I, I, I typed it in the group. In addition, in the chat, in addition to the different clauses of the amelioration proposal, um, for example, where slaves, family life was to be encouraged, slaves were to be encouraged to save, um, no master should take a whip in the field, they were to, they, they, Charges brought against slaves were to be investigated before they were actually whipped. Um, they also, in, they were supposed to get Saturdays off of the market and Sundays to go to worship. Um, they, 
and there were others. I don't know if you want me to name the all no of them. Man. The, the, the price, yeah. it, what I want to zoom in now, but how significant what happened, now? What, it it was, was significant was... because, for example, um, in the, the, the proposal, for example, in Demarara, the planters there believed that they were already treating their their slaves well. They were already doing enough for their slaves. And when they, they, they the metropole sent these other clauses, they thought it was too much. Um, and this was what led to um, the, the rebellion in Demarara. And also in Jamaica, a female slave was, was um, said to have stolen some sugar cane and she was flogged in front of her husband and whipping was one of the things that were prohibited and when this happened it it propelled um the the other um say for example sharp it's not just because of working condition why they decided that they were going to strike but it was also because of the whipping of this um female slave that caused the, them to plan the, the, the strike, which led to the rebellion. And that is why both the Demarara rebellion and the Jamaica rebellion is seen as the two, the, the two last major rebellions in the British West Indies that push forward emancipation. Right. And, and, and the, up, Brianna has her hand up for when you're ready. Okay. And if you look at um, even the very terms that Daddy Sharp had put forward, you would see that he was forward thinking to, a empl to an employer-employee relationship. That was where his argument was going. To say, listen, I know my worth and listen, I need X. Right, so we can go ahead and give Trudy her prize. Brianna, go ahead. Please. Okay, Miss. Um, in addition to what Trudy said, like it just further showed that amelioration, like it was failing and it wasn't going the way it intended. So it just gave the abolitionists a stronger case for the ending of slavery. Okay. And the thing is that they're, they're in some territories like Jamaica, and so they were really resisting it and felt it was an, an imposition. How dare Britain um, impose on us and, and interfere in our domestic affairs with our properties, right? So there was resistance in some areas. All right, good. Now, can anybody, so we can go ahead and give Trudy the prize. I think um, so some in the chat, there were responses coming up as well, Miss McDavid, similar to what um, Trudy was saying. So um, I want for the final question now, tell me about the, the, the British ports, right? Name them and just briefly describe how the economy of Britain benefited from the slave tree um, the, 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 um, the sugar industry. You want us to name the... Um, the ports, yes, the and, port? and also the ports and describe how the, the um, Britain had benefited from the sugar industry during the period of slavery? Um, the ports were London, Bristol, and Liverpool. Yes, Tiffany, good. Um, British benefited from the, the slave trade because um, in the colonies, there was an increase in the, um, the black population. Um, it was 25 to one because the, um, the blacks outnumbered the whites. Um, there, was, uh, there was the introduction of um, mixed race because some of the blacks and the whites were mating and so the mulattoes were produced. Um, 
there was a I want to think about it because you started off well, but you started not zooming into what I wanted you to zoom into exactly. Remember now, we're talking about economic benefits. Remember, this is a business. Should I mind you? I want to um, try the for the price. Hold on. The pattern of land ownership was changed because you had a lot of, um, before the safe trade, you had a lot of persons owning small parts of land. But when um, the sugar revolution, the re revolution came in, um, there were a lot of persons owning big estates that sugar could produce. Um, a large amount of capital was in invested into the sugar industry and most of the capital came from England itself and um, the profit that England was receiving from the sugar revolution, they um, used it to finance the industrial revolution. Um, because of the triangular trade, a lot of persons in England, they got jobs because they worked in warehouses and they worked in shipbuilding. Good, good, good. Yeah, it, it touched some, some nice areas. Mrs. Baxter, Brianna yes. had her hand up to answer. Let's go ahead, please. So we, I like, please bear in mind, they, they, they responded just a while ago. Like, I like that response. Let me hear the other person. Please go ahead. Brianna? Okay, Miss, because of the slave trade that Brit Britain's shipping industry it's going to further develop and so on to facilitate the trade and British banks are going to benefit as well. Okay, good. I want us to split the price between these two because the banking industry prospered. I mean, there were merchants, you know, loaning money and, you know, it's a big business. So the shipping industry, all of that, Britain was getting raw raw um, products to manufacture as well right so it what that these are the ways in which they benefited from the industry itself all right so i think i've exhausted my time here with matt david and i mean these students they are they are so interactive this is the type of lesson i like Yes, we, I mean, you guys are amazing. We so appreciate it that you guys joined us and stayed with us. I hope you guys learned something. Um, please, Mrs. Baxter, if you can also give the students and teachers on Zoom and YouTube your social media handles yes. so they can follow you as well for more information. All right. So I am Zara Baxter, Building Scholars on YouTube. Zara Baxter Building Scholars and Zara S1 2020 on Instagram. All right. All right. And of course, you read workbooks. You want to shoot me a question? Uh, you can get me at 876 WhatsApp call 876-812-0500. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Baxter. And Again, everyone, remember that this is the second episode. So our last and third episode of our CSEC series is tomorrow, same time, um, same place. Um, your teachers and parents have the Zoom link for that. And it will be Professor Varon Satchel, um, Mrs. Baxter's old teacher, my old teacher, <laughs> good old Professor Satchel. Um, so please tune in for that. Get the Zoom link. Um, from your parents and teachers if you haven't had it already and we just as always thank you thank you thank you thank you mrs baxter this was You're really welcome. amazing and all the presentations will be available on youtube immediately as we sign off so the one yesterday um if you guys missed it on egypt was very fascinating of course this one and then of course professor satchel's on tomorrow but for professor satchel please tune in live we love Uno. We love Uno when you talk to it and we can interact with you. 
All right, guys, so thanks again. So if there's no more questions or comments, that's it. So have a great day, everyone. Stay okay, safe. Okay, be safe, everybody. Take care. All the best for your exam. Oh, the topic. Oh, Trudy is asking me the topic for tomorrow. Um, let me let me read it out correctly for everyone, um, so that I'm not saying anything. <laughs> um, Professor Sachel will be talking on uh, well peasantry. But the correct title, as I said, I want to make sure I read it out to everyone. Hold on, guys. It is, drum roll, Caribbean economy and slavery. So please tune in tomorrow. Oh, yes, man. Anonymous Relim. Yes, all of the presentations, as I said, are on YouTube right now. So the one yesterday on Egypt is on YouTube. And then the one to date, everything will be on YouTube, okay? All right, guys, if that's, that's it. All right, appreciate it. All right, guys, be safe. Bye, everyone. Miss McDavid, I'm going to remain when everybody gets off to just ask your question. Of course, not a problem. Thanks, Brianna. I got Bye. your message.